Welcome back to our Bible study on 1 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 21 and a little bit into chapter 22 as we're going to continue this study series on 1 Samuel, 1st and 2nd. We haven't gotten to 2nd Samuel yet, but we will get there. I want to invite you right now to take out your Bibles, open them to the chapter 21 as we're going to be there in just a few moments. If you will, you can also download that study guide or at least have it available to you to be able to follow along as to how we're going to be looking at this particular scripture because because today is going to be, well, I guess you could say a rather strange day. Uh, up until this moment, what we have had is all of this focus on God's glory and the fact in, in the case of David, him giving God the glory from the moment he comes on the scene. It's all about how God is getting the glory in the middle of the, uh, the tri trials, in the middle of the problems. And how the presence of God, the glory of God, has left from Saul and now is upon David. And it seems like everything is going just David's way. Matter of fact, as we concluded last week, what we were seeing was that every reason in David's mind should be there that God is on his side. Not only has he been anointed as the new king, not only has he been able to dodge the various attacks that King Saul has done toward him, which was not something just of his own creation, but rather something that God had done through him. And now he's even had the confirmation of Saul's own son, his friend Jonathan, who has told him, you are going to be the king. I want you to make a covenant with me, a pact with me. All this we've looked at up until this point, even up until last week. And so you would think that David as he's leaving from Jonathan, would be assured, God is for me. We can say it even ourselves. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, the reality is, is that David is a real person, and we are real people. And so the reason for the abrupt change is what happens in David's life. David's life is going to be very much like many of our lives. We don't have an easy, smooth sailing life from the moment we give our hearts over to Jesus. Matter of fact, we still walk through problems. And in the middle of problems, we can see clearly as we look back all of the ways that God has protected us, has taken care of us. But that does not always insulate us from being fearful. And here in this particular chapter, it seems almost as though there is an abrupt role reversal. When we've had up until this moment, Saul going completely insane, being tortured by an evil spirit, David having to play his harp in order for Saul to receive some sort of relief from the, 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 the stress or the, the emotional anxiety that he is going through. And we see David always is this one that is strong. I mean, when he stands before Goliath, he's just a young man and he stands there defying this huge giant, the champion of the Philistines and saying, God is for me. And so we've always seen David as this strong individual, whereas in this particular chapter and quite literally, he's going to go insane. And uh, that's, his, that's the exact term. Uh, it's pretend in this particular case. But uh, David has gone from very strong to very weak. He's allowing fear to guide him. So let's go to the scripture today and we're going to look at what it says and then we're going to analyze it because I believe that every one of us, even the most solid in Christ, like David, even the ones who had received this special endowment of power from God, even David, who had been anointed, even David, who had in the Old Testament, which was a very rare thing, had the presence of God resting upon him. Now we as believers enjoy that, each and every one of us. The presence of God comes into our lives. We have Jesus in our hearts if we confess him as Lord. But even David, with all of those things, like what we could say we have, he suffered from fear. Matter of fact, there's one scripture, we'll get to it in a moment, where it says great fear, very fearful. David was running scared. And he is one that should have been able to look back and see all of the great things that God has done in his life, but he's unable to do it. So God has to intervene. Well, I'm giving you a little bit of uh, advanced information on where we're going, but we're going to be in chapter 21 and chapter 22 up until verse 5. So let's go to that scripture. I'm starting in verse 
verse one, it says, uh, uh, you know what, I need to change it into English. Uh, my, my Bible is stuck here in Spanish. And it says, David went to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered, Ahimelech, the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. For as for my men, I have told them to meet me in a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us as usual. Whenever I set out, the men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been provided, or, uh, had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on that very day, uh, that day that it was taken away. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought any sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was so urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. That day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But, he, but the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors and the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, look at this man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? I am I short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. I'm in chapter 22 now in verse 1. It says, when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their commander. About 400 men were there with him. From there, David went to Mitzvah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he, let them, he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him as as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. Now we're going to look at this scripture. And what I want to give you a, a brief understanding is that David has gotten scared. And now everything that we see David doing is not necessarily something that we can commend. For example, in this very first stage, because of fear, he goes to Ahimelech. You see in that chapter 21, the first verse there, it says, David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? So Ahimelech is afraid as well. First things that we can say here is that fear breeds fear. A leader who is afraid, and David has been anointed leader, a leader who is afraid will promote fear in others. Something that happens naturally, the attitude, the characteristic, the nature of the leader is automatically, if you will, it's not something that a conscious decision is made, but is transferred over. And that's why we as believers need to be very careful of our attitudes, our actions, the way we live, because the world is responding, whether consciously or not, to the way that we are. And so here David presents himself before the priest. The priest also could be trembling the fact that he, Nob, where he's at here, is only a couple of miles away from Gibeah, Saul's hometown. 
Now, if everyone knows that Saul has issued the order, kill David, and he's only two miles away, it's highly likely that Ahimelech has heard that Saul wants David dead. And so David showing up there is one that would provoke fear in Ahimelech's mind, in his heart. Matter of fact, we know that this is something that's well-founded because Saul has already decided that even his son, anybody who sides with David, David is going to be executed, is going to be his target, and the priest will be no ex exemption, would be no, uh, not left out in that particular case. And so we know this is going to be the case. But so David shows up there and he asks, he, sa he says that David then is answers the, uh, the priest Ahimelech in verse 2, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my man, and he goes into this, this whole lie. Now, is God behind the lie? No. David is lying to protect himself. David is lying as a result of fear. So, as a response, the priest there in, in verse 4 says, The priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here provided the men have kept themselves from women. First of all, we don't have any other men. It's only David. David is running scared. He's, he, he's been let through a window from his, his wife's place. We talked about this before. So he's certainly not been with women. But the fact of the matter is, is that Ahimelech says, I only have this consecrated bread. Now, why would Ahimelech give the consecrated bread to David when it's only for the priests? I'm going to read for you some of the texts related to this bread. But David is the anointed one. And so even though David shows up with a lie, Ahimelech trembling because David shows up alone, Ahimelech is ready to give him this bread. Let me explain to you what this consecrated bread was. In Exodus chapter 25, matter of fact, we're reading through the book of Exodus and, and, and into all of the, the word of God as we're, we're studying and reading daily. And we're looking at all of the different elements of the tabernacle and so forth. That was just exactly the way that God had shown Moses it was supposed to be. But in the law, what it was supposed to be, it says in Exodus 25 and verse 30, it says, Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. And later on in chapter 35 of Exodus in verse 13, the table with its poles and its articles and the bread of the presence, it was always to be there. In Leviticus, we have a little bit more of a definition of what it is. In chapter 24 and verse 5, it says, Take the finest flour and bake 12 loaves of bread using ten, uh, two tenths of an ephah of, of, for each loaf. Arrange them in two stacks. And so uh, the bread would have been, if it's stacked, uh, you, you could imagine the bread kind of like uh, a pita bread. And uh, so we have six here stacked up and we have six here stacked up and sta six in each stack on the table of pure gold before the Lord. By each stack, put some pure incense as a memorial portion to, pre to present the bread and to be the uh, food offering presented to the Lord. This bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath. And here is when it happens. It doesn't happen every single day, but every Sabbath there is fresh bread on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and to his sons who are to eat it in the sanctuary area because it is the most holy part of their uh, 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 perpetual share of the food offerings presented to the Lord. And then later on in 1 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 32, some of the Kohathites, uh, their fellow Levites, were in charge of preparing for every Sabbath the bread set out on the table. And so there was a special clan, a special group, that that's all they dedicated themselves. And this bread would have not just been like normal bread because of the fact that th this had been set out before the Lord, first of all, it's, good, it's just been taken away. So it's a week old bread, but it's been in the presence of God. Something about the presence of God preserves. As we were reading through 
as we were reading through the, the departure of, of the Israelites in the book of Exodus, and they start to see this manna falling, if you remember, there's a story there, a part in which every time they would try to gather too much saving for the next day, if it wasn't the Sabbath, it would go to worms, and it was impossible. But they were allowed to, it would be, they were allowed to keep that that manna the next day when it's the Sabbath because they weren't allowed to go out and harvest on the day or, or gather, if you will, the manna on the day that it was uh, consecrated as a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. And But there's one time when Moses commands Aaron to gather up the manna and place it before the Lord, and that way future generations would be able to see what it was that they ate all of that time. Well, if it would naturally have worm infestation the next day, or by divine intervention on the Sabbath, it was allowed to last an extra day, well, what would keep this from not going to worms? And it says, place it before the Lord to preserve it. Now, you may think that the preserving it was for future generations. Preserve in our English language has the connotation that we're saving it, we're keeping it back. But in this particular case, what is happening is in the presence of God, there is a preservation process that it doesn't get old. Matter of fact, if we were to go even into the book of Genesis, and we're getting a little off topic here, but in the book of Genesis, when we have the life of Adam and Eve and each of the people throughout the generations, it lists how old they were when their children were born and so forth. We do not know how long Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony in the garden up until the moment of sin. At that moment is when the clock started to tick and their age began. But in the presence of God, there is no time. When we get to heaven, we will not be getting older. We are going to be with God forever and ever in eternity. This is something that, that uh, we're, we're Again, we're getting a little off subject, but this is what's happening here. But the bread would have been special bread that had been preserved by the presence of God for a complete week. However, however, if you remember, it said there in our, our Leviticus chapter or Leviticus text, that there was to be incense along the side of it. And there was this incense was to permeate not only just the, the area, but this incense would actually permeate and become a part of the bread. And so we would have flavored bread. This is what the, the priest in this particular case comes and says, David, this is all we have. This is why it's going to have a different flavor. You've never tasted this before. This bread has been in the presence of God. I can give it to you if that's what you want. But that's the only thing that I have here. And the reason for the explanation is because David had to understand when he took the bite of the bread, why it tasted different than any bread that he would have tasted beforehand. Because he, not being a priest, would have never tasted the consecrated bread off, the, uh, off this special table of the presence in God's spirit, touching it every single day. And so David is able to take this particular. And so the key themes that we're going to look at here is the fact that God's servants are not immune to the problems. David allows his faith in this particular moment to waver, to quake at the idea that the king is determined to kill him, has issued the formal order to kill him. David understands that. But also alongside this theme of David wavering in his faith, we have the fact that God does not kick him out. God continues to bring him in. And that's why I wanted to continue reading in our text today, all the way through to verse 5, when God sends the prophet to speak to him. Because David, in the middle of his fear, is going on self-preservation mode. He is not listening to what God would tell him to do. It has nothing to do with his call that God has placed on his life, the anointing that he has as king. David is running for his life. And so let's go back to the text here. And in verse 7, it says, now one of Saul's servants was there that day, the tame before the Lord, he was doing the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. Now, here we have a situation where this guy is going to inform Saul. David knew it, but he's fearful. 
That's why he doesn't do anything. He doesn't even prepare Ahimelech from it. He has nothing. To, it just is running scared. And here we have the fact that the Edomites were arch enemies of, of the Israelites. How this guy, an Edomite, became the guy that was still in the temple and was a servant of Saul. He's going to be the one that's going to eventually kill the same priest that he's there with. This is a bad situation. And so we see this setting the stage for what happens next as Saul in his, his craziness, Saul in his insanity, in his intent to kill David, and anyone who sides with David kills off these priests. And he says in verse 8, David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? And that question is one that shows the, the increasing anxiety of David. Why do I say this? Because David is the one who knows that God does not save by sword or spear. Matter of fact, when he stood before Goliath, he says, you come at me in, in, with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel. He knew this. He's lived this. He's experienced this. But now in his fear, he says, I need a weapon. I need something. I haven't brought anything. But look at what this says to the priest. This says, here we have the seasoned warrior at this point. We have the commander that is most decorated amongst all the commanders of Israel because he wins more battles and wins more decisively than anyone else. We have this commander showing up, running all by himself. Probably the priest has heard that the king is after him. And he says, the king sent me on an important mission and I forgot my sword. Now, you hear the, how illogical this is? You know, sometimes it, it makes you laugh when you hear somebody try to give you a lie. Uh, and, and they really think that it's a good convincing lie. And you just listen to it and you say, that is so illogical. How can you expect me to believe this? So what's the response? David says, this is the case. So the priest replies in verse 9, the, so the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. Now, I wonder what the priest is saying. He doesn't say because the question that David gives in verse 8 isn't, I, have, I, I need a sword, do you have a sword? He, or that's what he asks. He doesn't say, uh, can you give me a description of anything that you might have here? He just says, do you have a sword? So the answer would have been yes, this one. But listen to the answer again that the priest gives. The priest says, the, priest says, the sword of Goliath the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah. In other words, David, remember, this sword couldn't protect the previous owner. Remember, David, that you went after the champion without a sword. This is the sword that belonged to the guy you killed. And so what does he say? It's right, if you want it, take it. But there's no other sword. David, there's nothing. You don't need a sword. You need God. But David's response he says, there's none like it. Give it to me. I love the dimensions. Oh, that's a good sword. That's a strong sword. It's not going to break. It's going to help me in the process. Rather than having this revelation come into his life with the word of the priest saying, you know what? You're right. I don't need a sword. I need God in my life. But David is afraid. David is afraid. Now, how do we know that David's afraid? Now, it, it, we've already highlighted the illogical things that he's saying. He comes to the priest and says that I was sent on an important mission. I forgot my sword. Well, that's crazy. So now let's really analyze. And I wonder, because in just a few moments, we're going to get to the scripture. It says David pretended to be insane. I wonder how much pretending was required. Because with this, now I want you to think about this. David goes and gets a sword, but not any sword. He goes and gets the big very well recognized sword of Goliath as he's running for his life. And where does he go? 
to Goliath's hometown. That's what it says in verse 10. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Remember, David had already killed Goliath, Goliath of Gath. David took Goliath's sword that normal Philistines could recognize, and even more so, the people who were in the same town as their champion, who would see it every single day. David goes, gets his sword, and then expects to hide out with the sword of Goliath in Goliath's hometown. Wow. When we lose contact, when we run by fear, the things that we can think and do are, in fact, crazy. And I'm not saying that David is crazy. I'm not saying that you and I are crazy. But there are times in our lives where we, we are so fearful that the response we give would probably just make God go, uh, what? Somebody else looking at it say, I don't understand. They were so strong before. They were such good people of faith before. And this is the reason for the study today, because this can happen to everyone. In the last year, you may have been one of those who ran in fear for a period of time. And now you look back and you say, I don't know why I was so afraid of coronavirus. I ran in fear because finances were collapsing. I don't know why I was so afraid. God has always cared for me because now we're after the fact quite a ways. And so we have time to start to look at the situation and calm down. But I'm letting you know that this is something that happens even to people of faith. God is a faithful one. Because in spite of all of this, because the reality is that his fear, David's fear, puts his life in jeopardy. He runs and he goes into the wrong place, into the temple, and reveals the plan, which costs the life of the priests. Then he goes to Gath alone with everyone recognizing him. Well, how do I know that? It says, as a matter of fact, there that in verse 11, when he gets to Gath, David, it says, But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David the king of the land? It's interesting. They know he's been anointed king. They recognize his future, his calling, his destiny, if you will. Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? And this is the very song they sang, the women sang, after David had killed Goliath. Nothing was hidden from them. It says, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David has lost con connection with what he had had and was so clear before. In 1 Samuel 17, in that encounter with, with the Philistine, David says in verse 45 to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have to fight. If God could protect him from the giant, why was he feeling like God couldn't protect him in that day? But something took hold of his heart. And that's why in verse 12 it says, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. Before he had gotten to the valley and Goliath was provoking fear in all of the army. And he stands there and says, why are you so afraid? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the armies of the living God? He doesn't show any signs of fear whatsoever. But here it says, not only was he afraid, but very much afraid. And in his fear, he goes on to do some very crazy things. It says here in verse 13, so he pretended to be insane in their presence. David has gone way off the deep end because of fear. Is it irrecoverable? No. Can God bring him back? Yes. Is he going to be able to bring himself back? Doesn't look like it. Look at what David has done. He's already gone and he's involved priests lying to the priests. He's gone and he's, he's trusted in a defeated pagan warrior's weapon. David has gone to that defeated pagan warrior's hometown to try to, to, to be safe and hide out where no one would recognize him in a crazy illogical fashion. 
David's plans in every avenue have backfired, and he has gotten to a place where his only option is to act insane. And so he says, while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva spitting out of his mouth, running down his beard and so forth. And this it is obviously not the sign of the king that God has installed and the king that God has said, this is a man after my own heart. He, David, cannot escape God's calling even when he has let himself go into fear mode. The very Philistines that are surrounding him are reminding him of his future, that he is the king of the land. David needs to do something. David took all of these words and, and he decides, I better get out of here and that's exactly what happens. So if we go into the next chapter, we find in verse 2, it says that uh, he became their commander. Commander of who? He had gone into this cave of Adullam. Now Adullam is still on the outskirts, outside of Israel territory. He's outside of God's promised land. He in his fear has fled, thinking that I need to control my own destiny, has fled. How many times in the middle of a problem do we flee from the only one that can really help us rather than going into the presence of God? Remember how this whole story started way back in the beginning with Hannah going into the high priest, into the temple and weeping and praying, God, give me a child. And that's when Samuel was conceived and born. And we have the whole storyline that we have today. Hannah, in the middle of her problems, knew that she had to continue to go into the presence of God. But here in the middle of his problem, David runs away. David runs outside. How often do we see people with some sort of a problem? Christians, people with good faith, with good solid foundation, all of a sudden simply abandon church because they're walking through the valley. They're walking in the middle of something else. They're walking in fear. This is what's happening to David. He's outside. He's outside of the group. And all of those, it says, who are in distress or dead or discontented gather around him. Remember I said that leadership naturally imposes what they're feeling on other people? Well, here we have it again. This is a situation where David, in fear, has infested with fear the priest. Now he's found all of these others, 400 men, to come to him. And these are the ones in distress. These are the ones discontented. These are the ones in debt. And they gather around him. And he becomes their commander. How much David has fallen is he continues to pursue his own way of self-preservation. David continues along this path, trying to figure it out for himself, who he used to be, the one that they sang about killing his tens of thousands, the one that used to be the commander of Israel, that was most decorated, most honored. Even the courts of the king, they would speak about his record and how well he did. He was this very highly esteemed person and now he has gotten to the place where he's acting insane, letting saliva drop, drop out of his mouth and run down his beard and he's only in front of a ragtag group in a cave somewhere probably filled with bats. That's his life. That's his life. And I know I've heard sermons preached by others who talk about how these men come and they raise up, but it's only because David raises up and they reflect always their leader. These Out of these 400 can form all of these mighty warriors even. And I understand that God can use them, but in this particular case, David is out of his element. He is a part of a social outcast now. And so what happens? From there, David went to Mitzvah in Moab. Again, outside of the promised land. But this time, he doesn't go to Gath. This time, it looks a little more logical what he does. It says, he goes to Mitzvah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. So David didn't go to Moab. David left his mother and father there in Moab. And David goes back to the stronghold that's in Philistine territory, outside of the, pro the promised land, outside of the protection of God. Now, why would he go to Moab? Well, the most likely and logical case is the fact that his great-grandmother was from Moab. Do you remember Ruth? 
Uh, you can read that story of Ruth. We've even read uh, portions of it in our Bible study and, and, and talking about different elements about humility and, and how she was recognized uh, as a person of value. But she abandons her home in Moab to come with Naomi, her mother-in-law. And uh, there she conceives after being married to Boaz and, and Obed is born. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. And so his great Great grandmother, his great grandmother then would be a Moabite. And so he would go back and have this ancestral line and say, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of family. Can you take care of my mom and dad until I figure out what God is doing through me and for me? And so this is what is happening. And David is just there waiting in the stronghold. But where is he waiting? He's waiting outside Israel territory. He's waiting outside of the promised land. So what happens? David has a call. God loves David. And here's what I want you to understand. God loves you. If it, you've been gripped by fear and have acted, shall we say, out of character, you lied. You've changed somehow. Your things that you're doing don't even seem logical to yourself. And you're just waiting. You get to a place where you say, okay, I just need to wait. I need to figure out what God is going to do with me. If you just stop, just wait. Because what we have in this next verse, verse 5, we said, we said, it says, But the prophet Gad said to David, God sends a prophet to the stronghold. God sends his word to David. And the word of the prophet is this, do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. David obeyed God. This study here today, this chapter, or chapter in five verses, is going to be virtually the only time where we're going to really call into question some of the, the decisions that David makes. There are other times, but David here has, has had this emotional collapse because of fear. And God sends the prophet to him and says, don't stay in the stronghold. Don't stay where your logic tells you is the best place. What I want you to do is go back into the land, and it says specifically, go into the land of Judah. It doesn't give a specific location. David chooses the location. But what we see clearly is God saying, come back into the, the area. Come back into the promised land. Now, God wants to solidify David. God wants to fortify David. Now, if you've fallen outside of that realm, you've fallen outside and now you've gotten into the habit of not going to church, not being in church, and, you, and you're, you're just waiting, you're waiting outside, and you can take this as a word from the Lord. Because it's time to come back in. God has not abandoned you. God did not tell David, oh, because you turned into a madman. Because you left Judah, you can't now become the king. Because you're outside of the land of Israel, you can't be their leader. He doesn't turn his back on David. David, in his fear, has run and done things according to his own plan that were never part of the plan of God for his life. But God didn't turn his back on David. David hears God say, so go back. God sometimes puts his people into a place that seems very difficult. And they have to, to face up eventually to their destiny, to their calling. David goes into Gath and there God uses the words of the Philistines. This is the king. A lot like in the case of Gideon. He goes down to the enemies to be hurt, to be encouraged. And the enemy is telling one another that dream could be nothing more than Gideon. God allows the enemy to encourage David and say, although David is fearful, he hears, you can't get away from my calling. Come back, come back. And then we also see that even when his servants falter, as in the case here of David, as when he, he seems to be falling apart, God confronts them with their calling, 
with the with a word from the Lord. And this could be it. God has not changed. The gifts and calling of God on your life are without change. He's not going to pull them back. But he does require us to come back to him. He doesn't allow us to be on the outskirts and do our own thing and there be a king of another portion. He wasn't going to allow David to become king of the Philistines. He says, David, come back into Judah. David, come back here. Come to your senses. Walk in holiness again. Don't give give way to your fear any longer. Don't allow your own ideas, your own concept of self-preservation to be the leader in your life. Allow me to lead you. This is what we see here. And God, after all of this time where David is running around acting like a madman, and he's seen what a madman looks like because he's seen Saul, and now he's the one. He's acting like that madman, the insane one, to convince even the king on the other side that he should not have a concern about him, that he poses no threat. David has gone off the deep end. But God says, no, you're not so far off. Come back in. Come back in. And with one simple phrase by the prophet, David obeys. David abandons the stronghold. If you're fearful, your likelihood is, I want to stay where it's most protected in the stronghold. But Gad comes to him and says, David, the Lord is speaking to you. I'm his prophet. Leave the stronghold. Don't stay in the stronghold. In other words, David, recognize that God is your fortress. And David will sing songs about it. Go into the land of Judah. And so where does he go? Into the forest. People could be hiding behind trees. He could play havoc with his fears. But David has made that turnaround, that change. And David is ready to trust God once again. So if you found yourself in this, and I want to close, and uh, you know, please don't forget that that you have the study guide with the questions on it afterwards. But uh, you know, in in the the storyline that we have here of David, David has to come back, and I want to invite you to come back. Reminded of the story, and and it became a popular movie, and so many will recognize the the story. But in the, the C.S. Lewis book, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we have the case where one of the children named Lucy goes and finds herself as the the first one that goes into Narnia, this, this special land. She comes back to tell her. Her, her brothers and sister about this Narnia land and all of her siblings laugh at her and doubt her and make fun of her. And that's when the professor stops every word and he begins by asking the brothers and the sister of Lucy. And he says, haven't you, ha- ha- does she have a habit of lying? Haven't you always found her to be truthful? And they reply to the professor, uh, yes, we always found her to be truthful. And the professor, and, and I'm quoting right now, it says, a charge of lying against someone whom you have always found truthful is a very serious thing, a very serious thing indeed. And you say, what does that mean to me? The reason why I bring that story up is this. The people like you and I, believers, like David, who have experienced God's protection, have walked into the valley with a giant and came out carrying his head. People like us, who have seen God's provision time and time again, when fear tries to grip us, why would we allow it? Just like the professor asks and says, Charge of lying against someone who has always been found to be truthful is a very serious thing. How can we level the charge that God is not for us? How can we try to go into self-preservation? We can't. We shouldn't. It's not possible. We have to trust God. And so in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the trial, that's why Paul says, no, in all all these things, when it looks favorable and when it looks devastating, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him because he has always proven faithful. 
Jesus has never left us. In the middle of the worst of problems, we don't need to be fearful because if Jesus be for us, who can be against us? So let me close with a word of prayer. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to make sure that you don't walk in fear. Don't give root to an insane, illogical behavior, but just simply trust that Jesus is in charge. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that even this mighty warrior that we would assume never was fearful. He's the one who as a child could walk into a valley and, and walk back out with the head of the champion giant. We would assume that he is the one that is ready and always valiant. When told he needed to go and kill a hundred Philistines, he went and did 200. It seems like he was always ready for the battle. Matter of fact, later on, David was the one that, God, you would say, you can't build a temple because you have too much blood on your hands. He was a very aggressive warrior. But then in one moment, after having all of this confirmation from you, after seeing that you had protected him in close quarters from the spear of the existing king, when the son or heir apparent has told him you will in fact inherit the throne, when everyone was telling him the fact is that God's will will prevail, he gave way to fear. And then he had to be brought back. And so Lord, I thank you that you could bring us back. If we right now are involved in some circumstance of fear, bring healing to our hearts. Cause your spirit to flow again. Let us leave our own perceived self-fortress, our own stronghold to trust in you. And that we would walk trusting you that if God be for us, who can be against us? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless your church. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue our Bible study. Be blessed.